been just over three years since I published my recommended export settings video for Keyshot here on YouTube. At the time, I was using Keyshot 9 to produce that video. However, a whole lot has happened in Keyshot since that point. Most notably, Luxion added GPU rendering and AID noising to Keyshot in version 9.3, both of which have a profound impact on my recommendations for export settings. Not only that, I've personally got three more years experience rendering in Keyshot under my belt, so this time I'm hopefully gonna be even better advised in this video. It's time for my 2022 recommended export settings in Keyshot using version 11.2. But first, a message from businessman Liam. For the past year, my team and I at Moment have been hard at work building out our library of ready to render Keyshot assets to help you visualize your products. We've got high quality interiors, studio scenes, and products available on our online store, currently all compatible with Keyshot version 10 and up. Maybe you're looking for a complete scene to drop your product into. Perhaps you're looking for some props to give your products context, or maybe you're just looking to dissect one of our scenes to see how we set things up professionally. They're all there to help. New customers can get 20% off the first purchase when they sign up to our mailing list. So if you're interested, I'll leave the link to moment.co.uk in the description below. Let's get back to the video. The scene I've picked for this tutorial features this Balenciaga trainer, uh, coincidentally also available on moment.co.uk very, very soon. The reason I've picked this scene, it's not as an advert, it's because it's got loads of fine texture detail, both in the trainer and in the fabric backdrop, and there's lots of highlight and shadow to see all across the image. And that's gonna give us loads of examples as we move through this as what the export setting should be. In this case, it's quite a challenge. Now, the first thing I wanna discuss is in the top toolbar and it's GPU and denoise because these are huge decisions to make when exporting. As I mentioned in the intro, GPU rendering and denoise were both added in Keyshot 9.3 and have improved gradually in the version since then. GPU rendering is the biggest change because it will decide which part of your hardware, if possible, you render on. Don't use GPU rendering, you render on your CPU, use it, you render on your GPU. Now, whether you have a compatible GPU depends entirely on what hardware you're using. GPU rendering in Keyshot is only available with NVIDIA graphics cards from the 900 generation, which I believe was Maxwell and up. However, if you do have a compatible graphics card on your computer and you can click the GPU mode button in Keyshot, it's likely that you want to do that because it's probable you'll get faster rendering performance with GPU mode on, especially if you have an RTX graphics card. Luxion have worked hard over the past couple of years to make sure that the difference between GPU mode and CPU mode rendering is very, very minimal. And there's only a few tools in Keyshot now which aren't supported by GPU mode. So in my case, I'm gonna turn on GPU mode because I know I've got a good graphics card in my computer to run this scene. Now let's discuss the button next to GPU, which is denoise. Now what denoise is, is a, an AI driven denoising algorithm, which will take the noise out of your render. It works in the real time view, and it will also be applied to your finished render after it's done cooking. Question for us is, do we want to turn denoise on for our renders? I think yes. In fact, at my company Moment, we all use denoise on pretty much every render we produce. Now the issue with denoise is that it will destroy some fine texturing detail, no matter what, and it will also hurt detail in the shadows. So in this scene, for example, where you've got shadows and fine texture detailing in the ways of the curtain, you will see here there's no texture detailing with denoise active. If I turn denoise off, you'll see some specular highlights reappear and lots more detail in the shadows. Now, if this was an image that I was gonna hand over to one of my clients, Ideally, I would render it without denoise so that we weren't losing any of that detail, but there's always gonna be parts of image where you can't really get rid of that noise. So even now, you can see there's still quite a lot of noise down here in this metal. So there's parts I'm probably gonna to wanna to render with denoise. In those cases, I'd run one render with denoise on, one with it off, and then I'd use Photoshop to erase the bits and basically come up with one complete image, which is somewhat denoised and somewhat not. In all other cases, in fact, anything you see on our Instagram pages and most of the stuff we hand over for our website to clients, denoise is on. So I'm gonna turn denoise on in this case. Now we've looked at GPU mode and denoise, let's dive into the actual render export settings that we've got here in Keyshot. First thing to do is to set the aspect ratio of your render. You can do that in the image tab at the top of Keyshot, go to resolution presets, 
go to either landscape or portrait and select one of the aspect ratios at the bottom. If none of these suit or are correct for what you want to export, then you can always go to the image tab and dial in a custom value in here. Now, personally, in my case, we mostly go with four to three in uh, landscape mode. So resolution presets, landscape four to three, which is what this image is here. But obviously, if you want to export for Instagram, then you could find the aspect ratio for that. Portrait is four to five on Instagram or A3 or A4 or 16 by nine, whatever you wanna do. Just make sure you've got that locked in because we want it to be professional in that case. Now let's go to the render export settings with the big render button down at the bottom of Keyshot. Start off by giving your render a good name. I'm not gonna teach you my file name in Scheme. Don't need to, just make sure it's something sensible that you'll know when you come back to it in the future. Now you can see on the right hand side, you've also got this drop down, which lets you give your render a custom name template. Now ours is in custom mode because I've gone in here and said that I want to uh, call this render or add onto the end of this render the name of the active studio, which in this case I think is the Be Bold Studio. So basically it will add Be Bold Studio to the end of this render. Okay, so if I just bring up my studios panel and mode, click on the studio, click back on it, it's gonna call it moment hyphen Be Bold Studio and then the name of that, which is what it's gonna be on our website. You can add all manner of customizations to this if you want to. If you don't know what you're doing here or don't want to bother using this, it's really just a, a workflow tool to make it easier for you, then you can cancel out of this and select none, in which case it will literally call your render whatever you put in this box. Next up, set the location that you want your render to appear in. I'm just gonna go with desktop for ease. Then you can move down to file format. As a rule of thumb, I would say never export renders in JPEG because JPEG is lossless, meaning it will have lost quality through compression by the time it comes out of Keyshot. We don't wanna do that. So I would at least go with PNG. PNG is lossless, is a really good versatile file format and also includes transparent channels or alpha channels if you need it. Uh, you could also go with TIFF, which is similar to PNG, but with uh, bigger file sizes. Or if you were gonna edit it in Photoshop or wanted the absolute best image quality, then you could go for a PSD file all the way up to 32 bit uh, and export it from Photoshop there. I'm gonna go with PNG, that's what we use here. Next up is do you want to export your render as transparent? Now this will basically export it as transparent for anything where there's not geometry. In this scene, everything is geometry, so whether I toggle that on or off, won't make a scrap of difference. However, if the only thing in this scene was the podium and the trainer, then everything else around it would be transparent. You know what work you're doing, you know if that's helpful or not. Now we can talk resolution. And if you've set the aspect ratio in the image style up here, you'll get some pretty good presets in the dropdown for the resolution of your render. So we've got uh, 1920 by 1440, 2560, 3840, basically 4K, and going up to 8K for this four by three aspect ratio. The question I ask myself is where am I using this render? Or my client, what are they using this render for? If they're gonna use their render for print, what size print are they doing? If they're gonna print these out for marketing, it's likely they're gonna be printing at 300 DPI. And then you can basically dial in the print size in centimeters and it will tell you, it will literally give you the resolution of uh, that you actually need here. So you don't need to define it. In our cases, we normally go to 3840 by 2880 because that gives us quite a versatile, fairly high res image to actually produce different content from. So this image here, we could take the top and the bottom off and we'd have basically a 16 by nine, regular TV size 4K. Or we could take the sides off, chop it like that, and then we've got a portrait image in high enough resolution for Instagram. So it's a versatile image, but it's fairly high resolution. Print resolution is much higher than digital. In fact, an A3 piece of paper at 300 DPI is somewhere between 4K and 8K resolution if you wanna match every pixel. So just something to look out for with your resolutions. If you're gonna do things like animation, which are just gonna naturally add a lot more render time, then you really wanna be tight with where you set your resolution. For example, Instagram is four to five aspect ratio, so image resolution presets, portrait, four to five. 
and an Instagram frame, the maximum resolution Instagram will show the width is 1080 by 1350. So if I'm just going to Instagram and that's it, I'm not going to use the image for anything else. Why not just go with that resolution and continue? Moving on, we're now at layers and passes. This is really important for post-production. Now there's loads of videos on YouTube which cover what these individual passes do and how you can use them in post-production, for example, in Photoshop or After Effects uh, to tweak this image, really fine tune it how you want it. Now post-production, we use Photoshop and Lightroom. We don't capitalize on these too much in our workflow, but that's just us. But the one I would say that you definitely want is clown. Now what a clown pass will do is give you a color blocked version of your image corresponding to different pieces of geometry and thus different materials and allow you to select them easily with the magic wand tool so that you can delete and select different regions of the image. If you're gonna composite a denoise pass and a non denoise pass, that can be really helpful to have for post-production. But if you wanna dive into it a little bit more, you can get passes for reflection, refraction, shadow, really important parts of the image like that. So you can tweak those as you want in post. So now we've covered the basics. Let's move on to the really interesting bit where people need the most help typically, which is the options tab. First thing you get to in the options tab is mode. Now this is gonna be fairly simple for a lot of you because most of you I'm sure are gonna be rendering on your own computer, in which case you just leave it as default when you click render, Keyshot will pause itself and it will start rendering your image. If you want to be able to carry on using Keyshot, then you'll go with background. The image will render in the background alongside another active version uh, window of Keyshot. Now, if your workplace or perhaps university has network rendering there, then you can go send to network, which will send the render off to the rendering network and then send it back to wherever you uh, defined after the render is done. For me, in this case, I'm just gonna go default. Moving on from that, you get to define how much of that hardware is being used. Now with GPUs, the only thing you can define is, is that GPU on or off? So in this computer, I have one RTX 3090 and that is on. If I was in CPU mode, for example, then it breaks it down more granularly and you get more control of how many cores you're using. It's actually not cores, it's threads. So most new CPUs, each core has two threads. So I have a 12 core CPU giving me a total of 24 threads. Um, but I can define how many of those are used. So if I don't wanna go all out on my computer or if I want a little bit more computing power for whatever I'm doing on the side or another key shop window, then you can define that here. Now the big one, render quality. There's three main options for this for how you define the quality of your render. I'm gonna go in reverse order starting from custom control. Now with custom control, you basically get very precise control over lots of different aspects that build up the render quality, including global illumination quality or shadow quality. Now, I haven't really played a lot with custom control. When I've used it, I've just found that my render times have been a lot more than I expected. And that's potentially because I don't know what I'm doing with the settings, even as a Keyshot power user and expert. So I don't use custom control. And for 99 out of 100 of you, I don't recommend you use custom control as well. Next up is maximum time, and this will basically just let the render run over a certain time period. Also, do not recommend. You should render based on the scene and what quality you need, not how long you've got. The only case I can come up with for using maximum time is if you just wanna see a render over your lunch break or as you're sleeping and then it's done in the morning. But in both of those cases, you can use the next option and just cancel the render and save it on the go. So maximum time, big no-no for me. The last option, which is the one I'm gonna recommend, is maximum samples. Nice and easy. How many samples do you want to render this image with, with everything equal, all the settings that we looked at in custom control equal, and just build up a better image as you go. Now the question is, how many samples is correct? And it's the question I get so much from students, from people on YouTube, how many samples do I need? Well, that's when you wanna bring up your head-up display. So. H on the keyboard, bring up the head up display where it's gonna show you in the real time view how many samples you've done in this view. Now you can see I'm doing in GPU mode in this resolution of my real time view, I am doing 10, 11, 15 samples a second, something in that ballpark. And at the moment I've got 260, 270 samples 
rendered, okay? Now, looking at the image, am I happy with the quality? Mm, well, I can still see the denoise is pretty good. Oh, the denoise has denoised everything, but I can still see bits where the denoise has struggled, and I can still see bits where, yeah, it's still not working that well. So what I want to do here is use a render region to focus on some of those aspects to see if I can establish how many samples I actually need. Now I can do that by going Control, Shift, and R for the render region, which we looked at earlier, or click the region button in the top toolbar, and then zero in on one of those areas. So I picked out this bit here, zoom in, focus my render, and now I'm at 100 and, well, I matched it, 500 samples per second. Let's see if I can bring this back. That's 2,000 samples, 3,000 samples. Uh, it's getting there, but it's still struggling, and it's going to basically bottom out. 5,000 samples is a lot. Okay, so that's going to be a job for post-production, having a render without denoise on. Let's see if we can comp them together. Just generally looking at this image, how many samples do we need? Well, I'm looking around the image to see where the image stops changing pretty much. So where the little bits stop changing. In fact, as it goes, you're going to get to the point where it becomes harder and harder to spot those pixels changing. Now for our renders at the moment, we tend to render between 800 and 2000. Most of them probably are an average at about 1,300 samples for our interiors with denoise on. However, we do have cases with some of our client projects that we do, specifically fabric lampshades where we can't use denoise and we have to just brute force it with loads of samples, in which case we have known to go up to around 9,000 and above 10,000 samples to get a smooth image. That is very, very rare. So looking at this image now, I really can't see that much change with denoise on, and I'm around that 800, 900 mark that I just alluded to. After I've come up with a pretty good figure where it's not changing, I'd maybe add another 20% just to be safe, just to see if I can get that little bit of extra quality in the render. So maybe in this case, I'd be rendering it around 1,200 samples. In fact, I did the final render at 1,500, so using that rule of thumb, I'm about in the right ballpark. Now, the way of thinking about samples is more samples equals less noise. That's what samples are doing. They're rendering out more passes of the image to get a more accurate, more smooth result. Now, the higher the resolution of the image, multiplied by the number of samples you run through that image is gonna give you the render time, essentially. Higher resolution, more samples, longer render time. That's where the issue is, and that's where you wanna be really concise with the resolution that you render at and with the samples that you do because I've seen so many times people really not knowing what they're doing, banging a value like 8,000 here and think that that's gonna make their render the best thing that they've ever seen. But that's not the case. Samples will just improve the accuracy of what you've set up in your scene. That's it. It's not gonna necessarily give you a better render. If it looks bad here, it will look just as bad when it's rendered. So when you've defined all of your quality settings, you can move on to render. If you click add to queue, it's gonna save your Keyshot file and it's gonna move on into the queue after, from which case you can process it later in a batch or if you're using network rendering, can send it off to network render here. If in the options tab, you just wanna render this image out, then you click the render button and you're off. Okay, we'll bring up a window, you can look around it and uh, either you let it run to the end when it's finished or you click stop and then choose whether you want to delete it or have the image that you've got. All this time, when this is rendering, denoise won't be active. Denoise kicks in at the end of the render, so don't be scared that it looks bad here. Just remember that when you click stop or when it finishes, then denoise will apply, and then you'll have your finished image. Now, if you're looking at exporting animations, a lot of what I've just said is exactly the same, only in this case, you'd have to not render a still image and go over to the animation section of Keyshot in the output window. Firstly, choose your resolution. Again, make sure it's very concise because that's gonna be scaled up with how many frames you have to render for your animation. Then choose what you actually want to render. Do you wanna render the entire duration of your timeline, in this case, a five second turntable? The work area, which is the gray arrows at the start and end of your video, or do you wanna type in a manual frame range for what you actually want to render? I think in most cases, you're gonna to wanna to go entire duration. First up, do you want a video output, which is gonna give you a video file? In most cases, you're gonna want that. 
give it a name and I'm not going to cover the name template. I'm just going to go nom and where you want to save it. Now for format with video, typically I go with MP4 H.264, which is a really common uh, file format. Works well with every program you throw at it. If you do go AVI, you can get issues and AVI uncompressed, I've known there's loads. There's video formats there. If you want to play it safe, go with MP4. And next up is the frames output. And I always recommend that you have the frames output enabled in Keyshot. That is going to give you every rendered frame of that image in a folder for you to use after. Few advantages to doing that. The first is if this animation render crashes during the rendering process, you haven't lost those frames. They're already rendered. So let's say this 150 frame animation crashes at frame 100. I don't have to render it from the start again. I've got 100 frames rendered. Now I can just render the last 50 because in a program like Premiere Pro or After Effects, you can add all those frames in as a sequence and get your video file in there. Now, if you choose something like PNG as well, which we've already said is lossless, you can actually use all of those frames after to get a better quality video should you need it. So again, using Premiere Pro or After Effects, you can bundle them all together. The last benefit is that you just get 150 images. Some of them might be good for still images that you can use across your project. So you're not doing any more rendering time. You might as well have the frames output. Now with your frames output, obviously choose your folder. I'm also going to go with PNG, just like I did with still images. And then the last thing in here is also passes. Just bear in mind with passes, that's going to give you a lot more frames. So 150 frames, that'd be 150 clown passes. Just make sure that you want all of that stuff. In this case, I'm not going to have the clown. I'd just go with the frames output. That's what you need to do if you're exporting animations. Everything else in terms of the quality settings is going to be the same. I'd still use default rendering mode unless you've got a network. Go with GPU mode or make sure GPU mode's on if you've got GPU mode. Maximum samples. And then in this case, it's samples per frame. Okay, so again, move through your timeline, pick a spot, and then let it render out. See how many samples you need before the image stops changing with denoise if you're using it. Go with that number. Because it's going to scale up with the number of frames, just make sure that that number really is as low as possible because the difference between 1,000 and 1,500 frames could be hours or days based on your animation. So that's it. That's my recommended export settings 2022 for Keyshot, in this case, 11.2. Hopefully this has good longevity and counts into the future. If not, I'll be back for volume number three. I realize a lot of information there, especially for people that are new to Keyshot, but hopefully that's given you some good guidance. And you know, this is exactly how I do things and have been doing them for the past five years. And I like my renders and I like what my company does, a lot of my students do. So I'm gonna give it my rubber stamp and hopefully it's uh, helpful for you. If you did find it helpful, then please give the video a like. Let me know what you thought about it in the comments down below. Subscribe to my channel so you don't miss out on any future Keyshot video content. But otherwise, happy rendering folks and I'll see you in the next one.